Thanks for having me here, and thanks, Ben, for the uh, introduction. I, have a, I feel sorry about the long title in your uh, booklet, so I shortened it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I, uh, I, I attended the National Academy of Medicine annual conference um, two days ago, and I was uh, in one of the panel called uh, Translational AI. So I think this is a neat uh, uh, term that uh, can characterize what I want to say in my long title. So, uh, but, but the content will be the same, OK? So I think I don't, for this audience, I assume I don't need to introduce what is medicine. I don't need to introduce what is AI. Uh, but I want to characterize, like Ben said about the session, uh, like uh, now a lot of people, especially for clinical medicine, we are talking about not just to develop algorithm, but how the algorithm can be really integrated into clinical workflow to help with the doctors, the patients, the providers, the um, you know, policy makers. So there are lots of uh, terms you saw, like uh, in the session's title, uh, around uh, AI in clinical medicine. I listed some of them here. Uh, from the top, I think uh, we go uh, clockwise. So from the top accuracy, I think that's still the most important thing that so people got enthusiastic about AI algorithm in medicine because they are more accurate. Okay, if they are not accurate, nobody's going to be interested in that. So performance, qualitative performance or accuracy is still the most important thing. But uh, uh, gradually people realize only accuracy is not enough. So like uh, you have an accurate algorithm here at uh, Texas may not work for me at New York City. So that's the notion of transportability. You may, you may think about some terms you don't see on this graph like bias or fairness. That's actually another way or an, 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 another topic related to transportability because it's not hospital to hospital, but group to group. Like if uh, your data is dominated by white people, can you expect it to work for black people? So that's different groups, whether the algorithm can be transported across different groups. Okay, so that's related. And then transparency. So transparency here, I'm going to talk about explainability, interpretability, but it is more than that. Uh, another related topic is reporting that guidelines. So not just making your algorithm explainable, interpretable, but for your algorithm, is there a standard guideline that you have to report about your data set, about your result, about your algorithm, all these things, okay? And then certainly, Privacy is important, so now we're not just to talk about the privacy of the data, but also the privacy of the model. When the model goes super large, you can even do reverse engineering to recover your raw data, okay? So how to protect the model. And then I think one thing that um, people don't talk too much about is actionability. We develop all those kind of models, but can these models be really actionable in clinical practice? You discover this feature is important for that outcome, but what if that, that feature cannot be changed, right? So that is all the things that I'm going to uh, touch upon, and uh, I'm going to embed my introduction into a concrete example. So this is something we have done in recent two years. So this uh, is a, a particular biomarker in your blood called parathyroid uh, hormone-related peptide. So this PTHRP is a biomarker uh, that is uh, related to the hypercalcemia in your blood, but is induced by solid tumor. So it is a, biom it is a biomarker, so when this PTHRP is ordered in clinical lab, there might be some suspicion that, uh, you know, uh, the patient is having some bad cancer, okay? And currently, this lab test is uh, not well utilized. It is a, uh, this is a rule. Uh, current uh, you know, laboratory medicine uh, clinicians, they order this lab according to this rule, OK? So in other words, so uh, the clinical lab people, they thought there might be a lot of unnecessary ordering. Because you order this lab test, it is indicative of some suspicions on cancer. So that, number one, drives up the cost, and number two, makes the patient anxious. So uh, these uh, uh, lab medicine folks, 
uh, uh, think about is there any better way that we can better utilize this lab test. So they organize uh, this data challenge. So this AACC stands for American Association of Clinical Chemistry, so that's the largest community in clinical lab medicine. So two years ago, for the first time, they organized the data challenge. Uh, you know, the data is from Washington University, St. Louis. So they want uh, whoever, data scientists and machine learning people, uh, medical informaticians. So can you develop a machine learning algorithm to predict um, if this PDHRP lab, uh, lab test should be ordered or no? Okay. And uh, 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 it's, uh, if, if you play with Kaggle, so you are familiar with this, so like, they have a public leaderboard, so that's when, you know, let's say two months of time period. So you need to submit your predictions and you look at your rankings and adjust your algorithm and submit again to see if your ranking changes. So that's the public leaderboard, okay, uh, uh, here. And uh, uh, when they evaluate the, fin the, the final winners, it's going to be another leaderboard called private leaderboard. So the data on private leaderboard will never be released, so after uh, you know, the competition phase is finished, you submit your model, they're gonna evaluate on another set of data you never saw. Uh, that is, the, uh, you know, the data used for final evaluation, that's the uh, private leaderboard. We see a lot of the cases. People got high rank like this, uh, this, this first one, rank very high in the public leaderboard and dropped drastically in the private leaderboard because their model overfits, okay? And this is our, our solution. So this is our team, so I had, uh, a PhD student from computer science, a postdoc, and uh, the uh, last person, Serena, is uh, the clinical director of our central lab at Wild Cornell. So, so we win challenge, and as you can see, uh, the performance is pretty stable. So we ranked the second in the public leaderboard and the first in the private leaderboard. And of course, there are lots of news by AACC. Now they changed their name to AL, ADLM. But, but that's uh, the, 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 the story. So uh, we develop a, a pretty good model quantitatively, and this is through international data competition. So we want to see, uh, this is actually a, a, a real need at, and our hospital is also interested in. So we want to see if we can implement this model uh, in our hospital. Then what uh, uh, are we considering? Number one is we want to see, uh, because this is a, Although this is not like a super complicated model, this is a kind of like ensemble model based on gradient boosting tree, but it is still pretty complicated. Uh, it is also a one type of black box model like Ben talks about. So we want to make sure the model is not talk about nonsense. Uh, so we look at um, if the features, the model use, important features model used to make the prediction makes, make sense. But, but it is, a, it is a, a ensemble of trees, so it is not easy to see directly. So we did something called post hoc model interpretation using the Shapley value, uh, additive Shapley value decomposition method, which is a very popular method to uh, interpret the model. And it is model ag agnostic. So what this, mod, uh, what this method does is they take your model input and your model output and do a uh, additive decomposition so that for every prediction of every sample, you can look at or quantify the contribution of each feature. Like here, every, every row is a feature and the, you know, the point cloud at every row is just a, 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 a set of uh, samples that the model is making prediction. And this is their quantitative contribution. So on the right means it contributes more to the positive, uh, on the left means it contributes less to the uh, to the positive, but less, uh, more to the negative. And this is their value. And you can see, for example, calcium. As, as we said, so this lab test is ordered for high, uh, hyper uh, calcemia. So higher calcium value indicates more likely to be ordered, so that makes sense. And there is something called PTH intact. Uh, actually, if you, if you look at my rule, this decision tree, actually, uh, clinically, this lab test is only ordered when the PTH intact uh, is low. So that makes sense. So we, we, we kind of like did a sanity check and look at these features. They seem to make sense. But uh, as I said, so this is a, 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 a type of method, very popular method, uh, belong to the category called post-hoc model interpretation, which means that it is not integrated with the model. 
uh, you can use this to do the additive decomposition to any model. I mean, so then there are some different opinions, like uh, this is a famous uh, paper from Cynthia Rudin from Duke. Uh, so her opinion is in high stake decision scenarios like uh, medicine, don't even think about developing these models. So we should, we should stick to uh, you know, uh, interpretable models like simple decision trees, linear models. Um, and, and I also wrote a piece like five years ago. Uh, I mean, my argument is uh, we don't want to make this black or white. So certainly interpretation is important, but you don't want to lose the opportunity of having some black box complicated models, but with good performance like ChatGPT. If you insist a transparent model, there will be no uh, ChatGPT, okay? Um, but recently, I mean, uh, that's five years ago, but more recently there is a paper from MIT and Harvard. So what they said is the false hope of model explanation means that you should not expect or demand the model to be interpretable. You should really do the appropriate evaluation. Okay, they emphasize on the evaluation. So model explainability or interpretability, a lot of the times is not that important. And a lot of the times it can mislead you, which, which is true. So evaluation is important. So then, so what should we do? So we, as I said, so the model we developed is from Washington by participating in that data challenge. And we take the model, we validate it, we, not validate, evaluate the model performance on two external sites. So one is a uh, uh, Wild Cornell, one is a uh, MD Anderson. So we certainly see the performance drop, okay? So this is direct transport. Uh, I mean, this is uh, like the, the original model performance. This is the uh, performance after model transportation. So as you can see, if you rebuild or retrain the model, uh, it, the performance can be better. Um, and you also see like the drop from Washington to MD Anderson is less. Uh, compared to the drop from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Washington to Wild Cornell. I, I will tell you some of the reasons. So this is very common. When you develop a model from one hospital, you want to evaluate it in another hospital. Okay? So people have concerns. Like this is a very famous paper last year make a big splash. Uh, Michigan, University of Michigan folks so they uh, evaluate one of the sepsis risk of prediction model in University of Michigan medical system, and they find a huge drop on the prediction performance, okay? And uh, certainly because that model is embedded in EPIC, so that, um, you know, uh, attracted a lot of attention, and then there is a uh, commentary from New England Journal of Medicine uh, you know, those people argue that, oh, it, it could be due to various kinds of shift, like uh, the clinician and data set shift, okay? Uh, and actually even more, so this is another paper, uh, you can, as you can see from the title. So don't even think about anything can be validated. There's no such thing called a validated clinical model, okay? They gave valid reasons, okay? Number one, patient population vary for sure. Number two, measurement procedures vary. So actually, one of the reasons why you see a bigger drop from Washington to, to Cornell compared to Washington to uh, MD Anderson is because Cornell used different instrument for that lab test, while MD Anderson and Washington use the same instrument, okay? So sometimes these devices can have big impact. And uh, certainly, I mean, the third thing is um, more difficult. Uh, these things, they also change over time, which makes sense. But, but uh, long story short is, uh, it seems like it is uh, a lot of the times not that realistic if we expect a universally, uh, you know, good behaved model that can achieve uh, a good performance on all the sites. We have to think of, so what should we do? Uh, so number one is uh, certainly uh, we want to increase the sample size. So like uh, being inclusive, getting more data, uh, that can certainly make your model more robust. Certainly from distribution perspective is you want to 
capture the sample distributions more holistically so that when you test it on individual sites, they are part of your distribution, not something outside the distribution you learn so that you haven't seen that, right? So, but uh, uh, certainly a, a challenge in medicine is the data are private. Lots of um, PHI data. Uh, so we want to protect them. So, I mean, federated learning is a paradigm originally proposed by Google. This, this term originally proposed by Google. So they, uh, you know, in their like a, a, a cell phone business, like if um, uh, they have a model on an app, uh, you know, uh, like it can predict something and you want to use the consumer's data to update the model, but the consumer's data is certainly private. So they, instead of asking consumers to upload their data to some cloud, so they do the model updates locally on your cell phone. And then what the, the information that is going to be transmitted to Google Cloud is just the parameters, model parameters, or uh, critical statistics of the model parameters, like the gradient or whatever. Uh, but it can protect uh, you know, data privacy because your local data never go out. It stays on your cell phone. The so same thing. Um, Medicine, so you change the, 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 you know, cell phones to the hospital. So we, you know, leverage more the data from more hospital to train such a model, but without letting the data go out of the hospital. Okay, so, so essentially that uh, can make this process more secure. Uh, and there are some, like, uh, I mean, this, this is a, uh, uh, opinion paper we wrote, uh, and, and this is a, a Nature, Nature Medicine article, uh, I think two years old, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, in 2021. So, so they implemented, this is from NVIDIA, so they implemented this framework, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, uh, during the time of COVID to do, you know, predictive modeling based on uh, the uh, long CT scans um, uh, to predict the oxygen uh, need. Uh, and they kind of like use the federal learning framework integrated more than 20 institutions globally without letting their, uh, you know, imaging data go out. Okay, it achieves a good performance. And this is um, another investigation we have done in, at the Mount Sinai system. They have seven different hospitals. Uh, we build a model to predict, uh, still in COVID case, the mortality. Um, and there are actually more, you know, considerations like you may, you may uh, you know, um, suspect. So, uh, I mean, because you still need to transmit the model parameters. Well, the model parameter encode some sensitive information, who knows, right? So they want to do further um, protections, so like this is a, uh, a paper published on Nature, you know, made their cover. They, they propose a paradigm called swarm learning. So what, what is swarm learning? So essentially, you don't, you don't put a central server there to receive the, 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 the parameter information and transmit back. So you replace that with a blockchain. I have multiple sites. If I want to update model parameters, I initiate a request, okay? And then others needs to agree. So this is using that blockchain type of mechanism. And once they agree, you, you kind of like uh, use your public key, private key, so to transmit the information, the model parameter got updated. Once updated, I said down, and then this is one wrong. And it can be completely asynchronous because these different sites, they can initiate the request whenever, whenever it's needed, okay? And, and they say even using this blockchain architecture, it can still not guarantee the privacy is 100% uh, protected, so they further add differential privacy on top of that. And on this topic, we also have a paper. This is technical paper. Um, we we investigated a purely decentralized mechanism. Get rid of whatever the central architecture. Let the sites just to communicate with other sites, um, and uh, adding differential privacy on top of that uh, in an asynchronous way. And uh, whether this is feasible or not. But but this is. We, we haven't done anything on medicine yet. This is purely theoretical. But, but these are just uh, some of the work. I tell you that one of the ways to improve the model generalizability or transportability is to uh, increase the sample size and make the model, uh, your training data more inclusive and make the model more generalizable. And you have to protect the data privacy. These are just the, some of the recent works. Uh, and then another way is uh, model adaptation, okay? So, I mean, this is some simple uh, investigation we tested, like we, if uh, 
we train a model on these sites and uh, transport them on the other sites. This uh, MMD is a measure of uh, like quantification of the difference between the sample distribution across the two sites and the AUCs you can get. So essentially, uh, the conclusion is uh, for data sets with larger MMD dis indicating they have larger distribution discrepancy, you're going to expect larger performance drop, okay? So what should we do? So I, uh, we argue we can do model adaptation. So certainly if uh, your size, every size, they have enough sample size to train a model alone, then retrain is always better because that fits your local sample distribution. But uh, the question is a lot of the times you may not be that lucky. So you may not have uh, all the size have that large sample size to train a standalone model. So in this case, what we argue is we can do model adaptation. So take uh, the original model, the source model, as a warm start, and then fine tune it with your local model. Like in this case, we did a simulation, like this is transporting the model from a train from Washington to Wild Cornell, and this horizontal axis is the sample size. You can see when the sample size is really small, uh, this uh, fine-tuned version performs much better than the retrained version because uh, you don't have some, uh, enough, a large enough sample size uh, to train a complicated model. But when your sample size actually here, the intersection point is 200. When the sample size uh, exceeds 200, you can retrain that if it, it can get better. But this is just a strategy I think is very important about model adaptation, okay? Uh, and of course, regarding this fine tune, there are more sophisticated strategies. This is a, a popular topic in machine learning nowadays called meta learning. So the goal of meta learning is to learn a, a good warm start so that at local size, when you fine tune the model, it can converge quickly. Okay, we have also a paper, this is also a technical paper, where um, we kind of like simulated a scenario, like we have several related diseases, a mild cognitive impairment, AD, uh, and Parkinson's. Uh, what we use meta learning to like, uh, uh, you know, fine tune the model train from one disease to another and we show good performance. But, but the, this is just another, I think, very uh, important strategy um, I think we should consider, which is a, a model adaptation. So we talk about uh, models is difficult to be universally good. Uh, and what is the solution? Number one, increase the sample size. You have to protect the privacy, this federated learning. Number two is do local adaptation of your model. Uh, and these are just like different strategies you can consider. Uh, and there are actually more uh, tough cases, which is not in a PTHRP uh, context, but we have uh, investigated in other contexts. Number one is evolving outcomes. Uh, so let's say you predicted something li like uh, sepsis. So the patient may initially uh, you know, uh, doesn't have sepsis, but later on becomes sepsis, okay? So these outcomes, your prediction, uh, can evolve over time, so that uh, becomes uh, uh, even, uh, you know, complicate the things more. Like, uh, this is one case we look at uh, the, cri uh, the critically ill patients during COVID-19 uh, got admitted to ICU at uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital at Weill Cornell, and uh, we look at their uh, because these are critically ill patients, which means that they are, this is during the first wave, March, April 2020, so which means that they are admitted to ICU, and they, in this case, we look at the patient who are mechanically ventilated. And we look at their organ dysfunction over time. Uh, so that is measured by something called the SOFA score, so sequential organ failure assessment score. Uh, so as you can see over time, so these individual a dashed curves are the individual patients. So you can see some patients gradually get better, some patients gradually get worse, okay? So this is an indication the condition is evolving. So when you predict something, it can change. And this is a, um, another case where we look, kind of like look at the progression of Parkinson's disease. I mean, uh, the outcome changes over time as well. But these are just the examples to consider. Like, uh, you know, when you, like previously we talked about transporting model from one size to another, but even within the same size, over time you have to monitor the performance because the outcome, and also in this case, the situation can change. So what does that mean? So here we build a model 
to predict the SARS-CoV-2 infection positivity based on the routine blood test profiles. Uh, so we initially used uh, the patients admitted to our hospital during March, April 2020. That's the first wave. And if you remember during that wave, for people who got PCR test, it's not like today, you want to get the test, you can get the test because the resource is limited. So people have to you know, demonstrate certain relevant symptoms like cough, like fever, in order to get the test ordered for you. Okay, so what is the consequence? The consequence of that is the positive rate is really high. So at that time, the positive rate in our hospital, New York City is the epicenter of the first wave, is 50%, 50%. So as you can see here is the data, we did two dimensional, uh, you know, UMAP embedding, so you can see the red and blue, so the blue are the uh, pos SARS-CoV-2 positive one, which means they have COVID, and the red ones are the negative ones, so you can see, uh, you know, the percentage, okay? Uh, uh, you know, fairly comparable, one group to another. But let's say we build a model, okay? And then it goes to like May and June. So I'm sorry, I think there are some, some problem with this, with this figure. Uh, but but you're gonna see a much, much dominating red cloud covering the blue cloud. What, what does that mean? So more and more people uh, get negative. So, so why is that? It's because the policy change. So since the end of May until June, so the testing is much, much, much wider uh, you know, availability. So anybody can order the test if you want. Uh, so of course, a lot of the tests are negative. And actually, from May to June, the positivity drops from 5-0% to 2%. So this is not, like, of course, the situation changed, the, 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 the uh, virus is evolving, but also the policy change, the resource availability change, okay? So in this case, if you expect the model developed in March, April to work in May, June, it is just not possible, okay? So this is another thing like about the, 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 type, uh, the temporal involvement of not just the outcomes, but also the situations. And this is another interesting paper that was online uh, yesterday. Uh, so together with um, uh, folks from Mount Sinai and the University of Michigan, so we did the simulation study. So what did we do? Let's say you develop a model you are satisfied with, you developed. Uh, and then, what does that mean? So that got integrated into clinical workflow. They can impact clinicians' decision. Let's say it is predicting something bad, a risk of prediction model. So you use a model so you, over time, you're gonna avoid a lot of these adverse outcomes, okay? So your data gonna change. Initially, you have a certain portion of uh, positive, which means that you observe the bad outcome uh, I mean, another group is not. Over time, so the, the size of that group becomes smaller and smaller because the physician is um, taking the suggestions from your risk of prediction model, take appropriate actions, and the outcome got avoided, okay? So then over time, your model won't be accurate, okay, because the data changes. And then a typical way is, like I said, you either fine tune the model or retrain the model. And retrain the model, the model gonna tends to underestimate the risk, okay? Because that uh, adverse outcome is reduced because of the actions responding to the previous model. And this can actually drastically de uh, downgrade your model performance. And we simulated three cases. Number one is like I just said, you predicted that, com that outcome, that outcome got impacted, and you retrain the model and the model performance degrade. And the second case is you predict one outcome, but there could be related outcomes. And that can impact the model you build for another related outcome, okay? And so, I mean, for this related outcome, you can look at, first deploy one model and look at the outcome, and then look at the related outcome. Oh, I mean, the, the, the data changes, the performance becomes bad, so I retrain another model. So do this in an alternative sequential way. The other, the other way is I just look at the two outcomes. So one is my target outcome, one is a related outcome. I kind of like tune or retrain the model simultaneously. And we observe through simulation 
So uh, in the case in ICU, we look at the outcome number one is AKI, number two is mortality, certainly related, okay? So in all three scenarios, we see drastic model performance uh, decrease quantitatively. So that raises a concern, like uh, when you deploy a model, you monitor the performance, you want to tune the model over time, you want to retrain that, that can impact the model and the practice. Okay, this is something we have to keep in mind. So now, because now we talk a lot about deploy the model, but after the deployment, there are still a lot of challenges. It's gonna impact the clinician's uh, uh, behavior or decision, it's gonna change the data. The data is what you use to train the model. So there are lots of chain effect, okay? Uh, and uh, I think uh, another thing I want to talk about is uh, like this uh, algorithm, algorithmic fairness. Essentially, because previously we, we, we talked mostly about transporting the model from one side to another, but this is mostly like you kind of like uh, transport the model from one group, typically defined by race and, um, you know, uh, gender, race, and ethnicity, those sensitive variables, and you look at the performance over different groups, so you want the model to perform equally well across different groups, not to give a particular group a certain advantage, right? And machine learning people, have uh, developed all kinds of criteria, qualitative criteria, to measure uh, like uh, what do you mean by fairness or disparity. We have to have a quantity so that we can do something on top of that, okay? Uh, and, but, 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 but one thing I want to point out is a lot of the, uh, you know, fair machine learning algorithms, they try to optimize a certain criteria by doing adjustment on your original model's, uh, uh, you know, decisions. They can do post hoc way or, you know, um, more like an integrated way. Uh, but uh, there is, a lot of times there is a trade-off, okay? So adjusting for fairness can cause a loss or drop on the model's utility. That's a quantitative performance. So we have done one work, uh, like, we consider both in a simultaneous way, so you, we want uh, the model to be fair, while at the same time, we want the model's performance to uh, preserve as much as possible. And uh, uh, this, is, this is one consideration. And the other one is, um, you can see, I mean, nowadays, those popular papers, nature, science, uh, so they typically what they do is a transparent model, means like it is a linear model. So it is very, uh, I wouldn't say very easy, but fairly, convenient to diagnose. So where is the cost? Like there is a, bi there is a uh, unfairness or disparity. So what factor could be the cost? Uh, and uh, you know, making some diagnosis and taking some actions. But uh, you know, a lot of times we are talking about black box model. Complicated model, okay? So you can use those criteria to quantify the bias or the fairness. But uh, what does that mean? So of course you can black, uh, I mean, uh, blindly, uh, like in black box way to tune the model uh, uh, decision to prediction to make it fair, but uh, think about how people can use this kind of uh, adjustment. Because we don't know, I mean, what does that mean? And uh, uh, you know, what is the cost? So we have done another work, this is just uh, uh, trying to explain like the quantitative disparity uh, into the decision passes. So we first uh, build a causal diagram so that we know the model makes certain decision because of certain uh, decision passes. And we, then we do uh, sharply additive decomposition of the model disparity on those decision passes. And we look at um, for if certain decision pass, they contribute a lot quantitatively to the disparity, but not too much on the utility, then we can eliminate that decision pass. So in this way, we can adjust uh, the model in a, a you know, transparent way. So you know what you are adjusting or what you are eliminating. Uh, but again, this, this work is fairly theoretical, but um, it's a, just a one important topic to consider. I mean, not just to numerically make your model fair, but what is the implication on the actions? Uh, that's very important. And uh, this is a recent piece we talk about, where we uh, more explicitly discuss this issue. Like this is uh, what machine learning people talks about. And this is what the uh, implication, clinical uh, implications 
Uh, and uh, one important thing I want to emphasize here is this sentence. Equality is not equity. So a uh, lot of the times we just uh, care about making adjustment to make the numbers equal, but is that equal to equity? Or does that mean fair? No, definitely no. Okay, we have to put it in the clinical context and understand what does that mean, and more importantly, is there any actions we can do? Okay, so there is a gap there. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, two last slides, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, that's two other important issues I want to talk about. So one is heterogeneity. So we haven't talked about that yet. So far, we talk about the population, you build a model, all kinds of issues, but uh, a lot of the times, like in COVID case, in this case, it's a long COVID. So the condition is heterogeneous. So now a lot of the times we talk about building one model. If your population is heterogeneous, one model would not be enough, okay? So one of the suspicion on why the treatment development for Alzheimer's is so difficult is because Alzheimer's is too heterogeneous. So you cannot expect that one drug can treat the entire population, okay? So how to handle the heterogeneous and teasing out um, the patterns or discover the subtypes? Uh, that's important. I mean, in cancer award, like subtype is a fairly uh, well-received uh, concept, but in other diseases as well. Like uh, in this paper, we tried to tease out the complexity of long COVID. Uh, we discovered these four uh, pretty replicable, uh, robust uh, uh, subtypes for long COVID. So that can have implications on stratified treatment. And the other thing is um, a lot of the times we just focus on too much about the outcome you're predicting. Like uh, sepsis, you are looking at the sepsis onset. But ultimately, once your model is deployed, you should uh, think about what is your ultimate goal. Is it to make your clinician more efficient? Reduce the burden of the clinician? Or is it you want to impact the policy? So there is some outcomes you want to evaluate uh, evaluate, uh, uh, compare uh, 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 with what? Like uh, with the AI model versus without the AI model, okay? It is, it is not just the outcome, but it is after you deploy the model, like the economy or the efficiency or the burden. So what are you trying to improve? So this is more like putting AI in the clinical trial concept. So the AI model is an intervention. With the model, with the mod, without the model, what benefits are you, do you want to see? So in that case, certainly we need a lot of uh, clinical trial design type of con concept, but uh, you know, we also need like um, these, I mean, this is a, 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 a trial emulation framework. We evaluate to see, uh, you know, to def try to define long COVID concept, but I just want to put the paper here because it's the same framework. So causal inference in, in the, uh, uh, trial, uh, clinical trial evaluation of uh, the AI model is, is important. A lot of the times, the, the ultimate goal you want to benefit is different than the outcome you are predicting. Uh, okay, so that's all the, all the contents I want to talk about. So I, kind, I try to touch all these important concepts, so hopefully that can give you an overview about all those different concepts and the important things we have to consider, and certainly they are all uh, interrelated to each other, uh, and uh, I think uh, there's no doubt uh, AI model gonna, gonna uh, benefit clinical medicine more and more, uh, but uh, there are lots of things other than uh, like uh, just the quantitative performance we have to consider. It is very complicated. And uh, yeah, this is uh, some of the portfolio of my lab that we are currently working on, so not just the clinical data, but um, all the other data that could be related. And uh, this is um, acknowledgement of my grants, and my team, and, and the right ones are, are the active grants. And uh, thank you.
Great talk, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering what kind of feedback you've received from clinicians when trying to explain these models. Um, do they trust these models? Um, is there some way to kind of relate these, you know, in a way, you know, it's pretty easy to understand a linear model, but when you, you know, get into the machine learning, it, you know, in my experience, clinicians are a little more, you know, reluctant yeah. to think yeah, yeah, this yeah. is true, you know? Very, very good question, so I can tell you human trust is more important. So if I know this clinician, we work with each other for a long time, so he or she tends to trust them more on the model I develop. So that's very important. And uh, trust is different than explainability. So there's no way, even if, let's say, you develop some causal model, you say, I mean, there is some causal relationship, they still may not believe. But I think what I'm trying to say is we need to build that such a trust we have to work with clinicians, sit with them day by day, discuss during the entire process, getting constant feedbacks. So that's a way to get the trust. So there is no quantitative way. Thank you. Thank you so much, it's a great talk. I have two quick questions. One is, um, Algorithmic fairness, I agree with uh, everything that you said. Uh, there was some theoretical work um, that essentially says that, um, I mean, first of all, we all know that algorithmic fa fairness, it's in the eyes of the beholder, right? It's a different definitions of algorithmic fairness. And it's often the case that um, they're contradicting. So you cannot yeah. satisfy uh, simultaneously several definitions of algorithmic fairness. So how, how in your uh, research or in research of your collaborator, you reconcile with that? And the second question, and federated learning is also often goes uh, head in hand with differential privacy, or with other privacies, which uh, again, as you said, introduces additional trade-offs and how, how, how does it um, reflect in, in your area? Yeah, yeah, no, I think both are good questions. I think first, in terms of uh, um, reconciliation of uh, different uh, uh, fairness metrics, I don't think that's a resolved question. Uh, really depends on like some of them uh, you know we I think we I talked with some people we were trying we were trying to develop an NSF proposal several several years ago it's a really you know some of them are not compatible by nature <laughs> so they have conflict so it's really like uh, still put it in the clinical context see which um, you know uh, fairness uh, is most important to you uh, and try to prioritize that and uh, you know, ultimately, if you think theoretically, it is a multi-object optimization problem. Uh, so when, when you solve that, you have to, you know, like those uh, uh, Pareto frontier type of way, you have to put them into somehow a, a kind of like a reconciliated objective and uh, you know, look at the Pareto frontier and then select the optimal solution. So, so see if it is possible to do that. Uh, and uh, I, I think to me, it's, a, it's not the, optimization process. It's really how can I explain this to the, to the clinicians. So I, I adjusted this because of that, if uh, they buy in that or that, is, that makes sense. And the second question about, uh, you said that the uh, 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 privacy and the fairness, they go hand in hand, right? So I think there are also like a, a theoretical studies, like uh, these two are embedded with, she, with each other and uh, lots of the times when you protect the privacy that can in, induce, uh, you know, other type of biases as well. Uh, again, I don't think there is like um, a unified solution or gold standard, uh, really depends on like uh, uh, your concrete uh, uh, clinical context. Uh, let's thank Dr. Wang again for the great talk.